Would you stand as you're comfortable as we share in a call to worship from Psalm 149? Let's begin together. Hallelujah. Sing to God a brand new song. Praise God in the company of those who love him. Let God's people celebrate their sovereign creator and praise his name with music and dance. For God is here among us, and he delights to hear our praise. Let's remain standing for our opening You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Faithful Redeemer, you are the beginning and ending of all things. You promise to wipe away every tear that death and mourning will be no more. You make your home among us and abide with us as our God. Teach us to live as the saints you call us to be that we may truly be your people, living and doing your will. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 9 through 17. I invite you to stand as you're able for the reading of God's word. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. 
Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? And I said to him, So you are the one that knows. And then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to the springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And I'll add, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord stands forever. And all of God's people said, amen. Well, good morning. My name is Tony Griffin, and I'm senior pastor at Russellville First United Methodist Church. And we are delighted that you are here to worship with us in person and online. We are thankful for each of you and for what you mean in the life of this church And any guests who are with us, we want to welcome you and encourage you to take time to get to know us. We would love to share with you the beauty of what it means to be a member of this church. It is indeed a blessing. Today is All Saints Sunday. It is a day where we celebrate the saints who are in our midst, the church militant, and those who have gone on to the church triumphant. They have entered into the fullness of God's grace. And you may ask, who are the saints? They are our Christian brothers and sisters. It's me and it's you. And it's those who have gone on before and lived the life that God has called them to live. And if you're like me, you say to yourself, well, I'm no saint. Well, right, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean we're perfect in the way that The world might see someone as perfect. What it does mean is that we have accepted the gift of God's grace. We have said yes to God's eternal yes that he has said to us. And we are seeking to live a life of response to the good news of that grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ by living under the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit to be who it is that he has called us to be. It is a life of growing in love of God and love of neighbor, a life of growing in holiness of heart and life. John Wesley and his younger brother Charles loved this Sunday, and they were thankful for this time in the Christian calendar. In a journal entry from November 1st, 1767, John Wesley calls all saints a festival I truly love. And on that same day in 1788, he writes, I always find this a comfortable day. The following year, he calls it a day that I particularly love. And then Charles Wesley, John's younger brother, both of them, of course, the founders of the early Methodist movement, Charles, in one of his many uh, many hymns, picks up on this theme of all saints In particular, in one of his hymns called, Come, Let Us Join Our Friends Above, which is a hymn that is in our United Methodist hymnal today. It's page 7809. And in the first verse, he offers a wonderful image of the church through the ages. That line goes like this. Let saints on earth unite to sing with those to glory gone. For all the servants of our King in earth and heaven are one. That's the essence of All Saints Sunday. I love that imagery, the beauty that that picture paints. This is also a time when we remember those in a, in a personal way who have impacted our faith It's always a time when I remember my parents and my grandparents, the way that they shaped my life in the faith, the example that they lived for me. And it reminds me of the example that I need to live for others, particularly my 
wife and my children and extended family and friends as I model the life that God has called me to live. And I love the imagery of coming around the Lord's table. We're both the church militant and the church triumphant gathered together and are hosted by Jesus Christ himself as we gather throughout all space and time. It's a beautiful thing indeed, and we remember those who have died, who are members of our church over the past year, and we ring the bell and observe silence. It's part of our job, you see, as the church militant, the church in the here and now, to sing them into the church triumphant, to hand them along from the church here to the church eternal in the glory of God the Father. So today is an especially appropriate day and a wonderful day to begin our new sermon series called The Good News About Death. It is good news, my friends. The culture doesn't understand that. The culture doesn't know that story. The the story of death in our culture is one of denial, and of avoidance, but that's not the story of God and Jesus Christ. That's not the story of the church. And so I hope that you'll find your friends and your neighbors who are not part of a church and you will invite them to come and to hear these messages of good news and hope. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God of the saints, God of resurrection, God of hope, We thank you for your word and seek to apply it in our hearts and lives today. Guide us and give us strength to follow you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. We like to hear the comforting words of Scripture, don't we? We love those familiar words, but the truth of the matter is is that not all of the Bible are words of good news. Sometimes we read a passage and we think, I didn't know that was in there. I didn't know that's supposed to. How is that good news for me? And I think that people say that perhaps in the face of Revelation. I mean, it's, it's a strange book, no doubt about it. We rarely think of the book of Revelation, also known as the Apocalypse of John, as a book of good news to turn to for comfort and for hope. Because our culture and certain segments of the church have co-opted Revelation and used it in crazy ways, folks. And so we need to think about really what's going on in the book of Revelation. What was going on for the readers and what is going on for us now and how is it a good word for us today. Revelation, as strange as it may sound, is that good news As Brian Erickson says, Revelation's primary intent is to comfort the saints on this side of God's big reveal. It is to give a word of hope to those whose worlds have come apart. It is to give, uh, Revelation is not a map to the end, he says. It's a promise to those who feel as if they are already at the end, that a new beginning awaits. It's a word of hope. You see, Revelation is a particular genre of literature that's called apocalyptic. That's a strange and rare kind of literature. It's a highly symbolic form of literature written to people suffering under persecution to offer them a word of hope in their difficult times. In this case, It's early Christians suffering under the tyranny and the persecution of the Roman kingdom. In fact, the enemy in the book of Revelation is referred to as Babylon. But that's symbolic for Rome. It is code for the readers who know what the symbols mean. In fact, the enemy in the book is code for Rome. Its readers would understand those references and find hope in the stories that God has not abandoned them. Not only has he not abandoned them, but you'll notice in the stories of Revelation as well that he's with them and the bad guys are going to get it in the end. And you can understand how that would be good news when you're suffering at the hands of an empire that is trying to crush you. So the scene in today's passage 
is a scene which is referred to in many prayers and liturgies of the church. It's a scene called the white-robed army of martyrs. In other words, they are the ones who have suffered under oppression and died for their faith and are now in God's presence. It's amazing imagery when you think about it. Just try to picture in your mind a sea of persons all robed in white for as far as you could ever see. You can't even find the end of them. And they're gathered around the throne of grace and mercy and goodness, gathered around this God who has provided a way for them to new life and to new hope. And they are singing praise. They are worshiping the one who has provided all that they need. And then the next bit is a little strange when we think about it. Their robes have been cleansed with the blood of the Lamb. We don't think about blood as having the power to cleanse or, or something that would whiten, right? But think about it. It's symbolic of the power of God's grace. In the ancient Hebrew culture, remember that blood was seen as the life of something. And this blood is life for all. It's not just life in the here and now, but for all eternity. In it is found redemption. So it's not just ordinary blood. This is the blood that has the power to change everything. It takes the stains of life, the ups, the downs, the struggles, the pain, the hurt, the wrongs that have been endured. They're now gone, cleansed, and washed clean. Not by anything that they have done, the saints in light, not by anything that we have done, nor is it anything that we could ever do. It's only by and through the faithfulness of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus redeems our suffering. I'm currently finishing a book called Speaking of Dying, Recovering the Church's Voice in the Face of Death by the famed preacher Fred Craddock along with Dale Goldsmith and Joy Goldsmith. The book looks at 10 pastors who encountered illness and death while serving churches. And how the pastors and congregations dealt with those difficult situations. The research found that the pastors in the churches weren't the best at communicating about death and dying. In fact, more often than not, they used the narrative and language of the culture rather than the language and narrative of the church. As the author puts it, the pastors and churches were victims of the wrong story. Are we victims of the wrong story? Do we fail to recognize the power and the way that the imagination can open up to the beauty and wonder of what it is that God has done through Jesus Christ? The wonderful imagery of Scripture and the language of faith. Instead, we have co-opted and are using the language of the culture. In the early church, what happened, however, was this. When the faithful Christian would die, they would gather where that, where that Christian died, or they would go to the catacombs, the burial places, where they could hide and they could gather together because they were often under oppression, right? They could come together and they could sing the stories of their faith. They could remember who they are and to whom they belong. And they would cry out to God in thanks for all that he has done as they mourn the death of this faithful one who has moved from the church militant to the church triumphant. The early church, you see, didn't, knew that its faith didn't come out of nowhere. They knew that its faith had been passed on. It had started at the beginning with Jesus Christ, the dying and the, and the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ is at the heart of the story about death, of who we are as Christians. It is the story. It is the one that shapes us that shapes our lives, not the language of the culture, but the good and faithful dying of Jesus Christ. And we so easily forget that. Because we hear the messages of the world all of the time. And that's why 
It is so important for us to worship. That's one of the many reasons. But we come together and worship, and as we worship, the stories of the living Christ are told. The stories of hope and resurrection and new life are rehearsed, and we remember again, we are put back together as the body of Christ to be who it is that God has called us and to live into the power that he gives through the power of the Holy Spirit. The truth of the matter is, is we often think of worship as something that's optional, just occasional. It's all right. It's just something we do every now and then. And that is tragic because we have to hear the stories. We have to live out the faith. We have to come together as the body of Christ to be nurtured and put back together into who it is that God has called us to be. Worshiping makes it easier to remember who we are and to whom we belong. You see, at the center of who we are is that we are a child of God. At the center of the Christian life is an identity that is modeled in the ritual of baptism. It's symbolized in that ritual action of dying to sin and rising to new life in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is about not following the kingdoms of the culture anymore to following the kingdom of God and living out that narrative. We should be reminded every time that we see a baptismal font, every time that we walk into a church and we have the ability to touch the water, and I love how the symbolism of the church and its architecture and the structure reminds us of those things. I love how the stained glass tells stories of who we are because we must be reminded and live in to who we are. Our collective identity is found in our collective identity as Christians in the church of Jesus Christ. There is no such thing, as John Wesley says, as a solitary Christian. We are Christians Together. Think about some of that architecture that you've seen before. When you walk into the nave or the sanctuary of the church, and I'll remind you that nave literally means boat. Think about some of the churches you've seen as you've walked in and you've seen that, that wood up there that reminds you that if you were to flip that over, it's like the hull of a boat. And we're all in that boat, the church, together. It is what saves us and carries us through the waves that crash against us. It's reminiscent of that Noahic covenant, God's covenant with Noah, that he would save them and deliver them. We are saved and delivered. And I could go on and on. The crosses and the shape of a, of a nave as the cross of Christ, it reminds us that we are God's children. Not who the world tells us we are. That we are what we buy or what we do, the things that we can have, our abilities in the world to be someone special or spectacular in the eyes of the world. We have to remember that the point is, is that when we're plunged beneath the waters of baptism, we're dying to the old self, rising to new life in Christ and the power of the Spirit, dying to the old life defined by our culture and rising to the new life defined by Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. We must remember who we are and to whom we belong. So on this day, this day of all days, we remember. We remember and give thanks for all that God has done, is doing, and will do. And we give thanks for what he has done in the lives of the faithful who have gone into the beyond, into the fullness of his kingdom. And what does it mean for us as we think about this passage in particular today? We worship. We worship even in the midst of the craziness of this world in which we live. Perhaps most especially because of the craziness of this world in which we live. It means seeing what the world cannot see. That God has revealed the precious truth that we are a family. All God's children. And that one day we will sit at a great feast 
robed with all of the family in white. And it's a feast that we could never buy or accomplish on our own. It's pure grace. So today we remember the ones who have gone on before us. And we remember that they hunger no more. They thirst no more. The sun does not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne is their shepherd. And he guides them into the waters of life. And he wipes away every tear from their eyes. Could there be any better news? Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us give thanks to God for all the saints of our lives and the witness that they have shared with us, even as we continue to walk this journey of faith and to make our way to glory that God has prepared for all of us. Arnold Bowden. Millicent Cook. Linda Jones. Bobby Mullen. John Newton. Colleen Owen. Chase Real. Let us pray. Eternal God, our help in ages past and our hope for years to come, we praise you for the saints of all times and places who have walked the road of faith before us and beside us, for their witness to your love and their commitment to your justice for their trust in your mercy, regardless of their circumstance. We give you thanks and praise. God of all creation, we praise you for all your servants who have witnessed to your truth, who have shown us your love, who have inspired us to have hope. By their example of faith, hope, and love, remind us of your calling to join in making your new creation real in this world and the next. God of grace and peace, we praise you for women and men and children who reflect your love into our world. Guide us to continue their faithful work as we too walk in the light of your love. God of all saints, today we especially remember the saints from among this community who have departed our company over this past year. We thank you for their faithful witness, for their courage amidst strife, and their hope in the face of death. We remember so many other saints who have walked this road with us, whom we name before you in silence. Continue to inspire us by their faithful witness, that we too may join in bringing your justice, mercy, and peace, and love to this world. Eternal God, as we walk this pilgrim way, make our faith firm, our hope clear, our love pure, that we may join the saints of all the ages in praise eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Christ our Lord invites to his table all those who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves his love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we come to a time of offering, of giving back, um, I have a picture to show you of your tithes and offerings in work in this community. And this happens to be of youth ministry in our church. We had a great event this week. It's our biggest event we've had since COVID started. Uh, there were challenges with it, but it was a wonderful time for our fifth through 12th graders. And you'll see some pictures also of them earlier in the summer uh, playing uh, nine in the air, if you don't know what that, nine in the air? Nine square in the air. That's a game in case you don't know what it is. Um, but Pastor Cindy and her crew lead this ministry and they invest so many hours in planning things and organizing things all so they can love on our kids. And we could not do those things. Uh, we would not have the staff, we would not have the resources if it wasn't for your faithful giving week in and week out. I'll remind you of ways that you can give. They're on your screens now. There are many. You can call us. You can give on our website. You can text to give 479-777-9640. You can mail a check. If you're here, you get to put it in the offering plate. Isn't that nice? And you also, we also have a simple give app that you can set up one time or reoccurring giving. Well, let us uh, bless the tithes and offerings that will be given this morning. Generous giver of all that we need, please accept these gifts that we give, and also these gifts of bread and juice that one day we may all share in your holy feast spread out all over the world. We pray this in the name of Jesus who sets the table for all of his people, a table rich of food and full of abundant joy. Amen. Please remain standing for the great thanksgiving. It is a beautiful day to think about the power of God and his love and all the saints gathered around his table. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers. God of all children to all generations. 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. You may be seated. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all your saints, especially those whom we name before you and name in our hearts. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, strengthen us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one in ministry to each other, and one in ministry to the world until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with, all, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. The bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks 
is a sharing in the blood of Christ. When you came in, you should have received the elements in a package just like this. And if you peel the top part of back, you can receive the bread. Let us do that together now. The body of Christ given for you. And then if you peel that second bit back, let's take the cup, the blood of Christ given for you. And if now we could pray together the prayer after communion, let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Well, I'm so thankful for all of you that have worshipped with us here today. We serve a mighty God, and we are grateful for His presence. If you are new to the church and uh, would be interested in talking about membership, which we as United Methodists believe a means of grace in the life of the church, we would love to talk with you and encourage you and teach you about that. And we also are available to pray with you anytime. Please call your pastors or see us after the service. We would be delighted to pray with you as we pray for each other throughout the week. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn. this, people of God. It's not easy to wear a mask, a microphone, and glasses 
and navigate them well all the time. That's not easy to do. Well, our Lord has been with us. He is with us and goes with us to all our places of work and our places with family, all the ups and downs of life. But we gather back again next week and we worship. Why? Because the story of God is our story. The Christian story is our story. We are named and claimed by him and called into the life of the church by him. And as we transition from this life to the next, I love those words at the end of Revelation 7. He says this, you will hunger no more. You will thirst no more. The sun will not strike you nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne is our shepherd. And he guides us to springs of the water of life. And God wipes away every tear from their eyes. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Friends, we are so glad that you have joined us in worship today. And we hope that it has been a blessing to you as much as it has been to us. For those of you who are gathered here in person, we ask that when we sing our Bind Us Together song, you would just bind together with those in your immediate family. And then afterwards, if you would be seated, enjoy the postlude that Mary Lou plays as the ushers come and I send you out one row at a time. And when you go, if you would do us a great favor, take your little communion cup that you've just used and throw it away in the trash cans that are provided for you just outside the doors. We have gathered with all the saints at Christ's table today, renewed and refreshed by being together. So go in that strength to live out your yes to God's yes. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.